Okay, I'm back for the next section. This section will be covering um, P.4, factoring polynomials. Now this is a pretty lengthy section. So I am going to cut this section into two pieces. If you look on your um, class schedule or your class calendar, um, you will notice that there is a part one and a part two for P.4. Now there's only one homework assignment for P.4, but the lesson itself is pretty lengthy. So I am going to use two videos um, to cover this section. So essentially I'm going to chop it off right here, okay? We'll talk about common factors and we'll talk about special polynomials. And then before we get into trinomials, we will, in grouping, I'll go to another video, okay? So for part one, let's continue. So polynomials with common factors. The process of writing a polynomial as a product is called factoring. It is an important tool for solving equations and for simplifying rational expressions, which we will do later. Unless noted otherwise, when you are asked to factor a polynomial, you can assume that you are looking for factors that have integer coefficients. That means whole numbers, but they could be negative. If a polynomial does not factor using integer coefficients, then it is considered prime or irreducible over the integers. However, later you will learn that you can factor something like this um, when you talk about outside just integers, because I can factor that. I'll give you an, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff that we're gonna learn that we haven't learned yet that you'll have to take my word for it if I factor this. So we haven't learned anything about radicals just yet, but if you take my word for this, these are two binomials. This is a real number and so is that. It's just not an integer, okay? These are called radicals. And if it, you cannot take the square root of that and it's not a nice number, and it's not, the square root of three is like one point something or another. Um, but if you do that, they're called irrational. Now we're gonna get into those work vocabulary words in a whole nother section. Um, it will still be on this unit test, just not yet. Um, but what I wanted to show you is if I do distribute this, I get negative square root of three with X on the outside. And then if I multiply these, um, oh, one of them should have been a plus sign. So this one times this, this one times that, that's a minus. Then a positive cube root of X or square root of X times that will give me positive square root of three X. And a positive times a negative will give me negative. And square root of three times square root of three is square root of three squared, right? Um, however, this one is negative and this one is positive, which means they will cancel each other out. And then here, the square and a square root actually cancel each other and I just have three. So again, this is talking about some stuff that we don't really know yet, like how to simplify this and how to simplify that. But if you take my word for it that those do cancel and so does the square root and the square, then I can factor this into two factors and it does multiply out to give me that, okay? So remember, um, factoring is basically the reverse of multiplying. So normally you would start off with your binomials first, you distribute everything and then get an expression. Well, now what we're doing in the factoring section is we're taking this expression and we're trying to figure out what would go in the two parentheses before we multiplied and combined like terms. Okay, and so that process can be pretty tricky, right? Especially if terms are being combined because the term that you have here in the middle isn't necessarily going to match one of these items exactly, okay? So it is pretty difficult to figure that out. Now, there are a bunch of different methods. Um, I'm going to focus on just one specific method but there are some methods that you do have to use, like common factors and grouping are just general 
uh, methods. But when it comes to factoring trinomials, um, which are polynomials with three terms, right? When we get to factoring trinomials, there are a few methods to use. Um, I particularly like to use one and then be done with it, okay? But there's a guess and check method, and then there's another method that we'll cover. Anyway, let's keep going with the common factors, okay? Oh, and see, it says over the real numbers, that polynomial right there could actually be factored, right? It could be factored into this, okay? Now, a polynomial that is completely factored, that happens when each of its factors is prime, okay? That means that once I do get it into the two parentheses, this cannot be factored anymore and this cannot be factored anymore, okay? Whereas if you had an expression like this and you factored it, this factor here can be factored some more. And so notice that for this expression with the plus four at the end, you have the X minus one, but then that term factored more, okay? And then once you have it where none of these will factor anymore, you have the complete factorization, okay? So the trick though is, is one, how do I get from here to here? And then two, how do I know that one's not gonna factor and how do I know that this one does, okay? So we need some more information for us to get to those conclusions. So it says the simplest type of factoring involves a polynomial that can be written as the product of a monomial and another polynomial. The technique used here is the distributive property. So you take A times this B and then A times that C. And those are the two expressions you end up with um, in the reverse direction, okay? So essentially what you're trying to do is you're trying to figure out what was the common thing that they multiplied here? What was this? And then once you figure that out, you basically tear it out and then tell me what the factors would be left over, okay? So that's called factoring out. Whenever you figure out what they had in common and then you take it out, that's called factoring out. So for our first example, we have these problems. So we have 6x cubed minus 4x, and here's the solution. So they notice that both of these terms have an x in common, and they also can both be, both of these numbers can be divided by 2. Or another way to phrase that is that both of those numbers can be represented as 2, times another number, okay? And so since they have the two in common, the factor two in common and the factor X in common, the common factor is two X. And so what they do is they write that common factor for both terms, and then they figure out what would need to be multiplied by it, okay? So if you already have the factor two X, what do you need to multiply by two X to get six X cubed? Well, two times three gives me six. And if I want a cube, but I only have an X to the one, I would need a square, okay? So that means that two X times three X squared will give me that six X cubed. And the same here, you wanna break it up into two X times something, okay? Now they did keep the symbol in the middle the same, of course, um, but here two X, I don't need any more variables, right? Because the X is already there, but two times two is four. So we do need this two here. So two X times two is this four X. Once you know what's being multiplied by that common factor, you're basically taking the common factor out as one because this is the reverse of distribution, okay? So you're taking it out as a single term in the front and then you're going to take that factor 3x squared and this factor 2 inside the parentheses 
And so you can always check your answer to make sure that it's correct by distributing. So if I distribute that, I get 6x cubed minus 4x. And so then that does check out that is the original expression that we had. So that was factored correctly. Now, um, for example B, we had this expression. Now for this expression, they noticed that all of them could be, um, oh, this is a typo that should be 16. Let me make sure it's on the other problem. Yeah, so it was here, but it didn't make its way over here. So let's make sure that we write in that one so that it is a 16, okay? So between 4, 12, and 16, they did realize that all of those numbers could be divided by 4. They could also be divided by 2. However, when you are determining the common factor, you always want to determine the greatest common factor, also known as the GCF, greatest common factor. Okay. So even though I know all of these numbers could be divided by 2, they can also be divided by four, and you must go with the greater factor, okay? Now, another thing that's special about this example is any time that your very first um, term is negative, you have no choice, you must factor out a negative common factor, okay? So that would be immediately the first thing. So yes, they can all be divided by four, so four is my common factor. But notice it's not just four, it's negative four, and that's because this first term is negative. In the previous example, my first term was positive, and therefore my common factor was positive. So then let's figure out negative four times what will give me negative four x squared. Well, negative four times x squared gives me this term. Then I brought my plus sign down, and we're saying negative four times what will give me positive 12 X. Well, that would be a negative three X. Then we're bringing the plus sign down again. You've got a negative four and a negative four times what would give me a negative 16. Well, a negative four times a positive four would give me that negative 16. And then when I take this common factor out, it comes out as one. Remember it's the reverse of distribution. And then what you have left over is this term. And instead of writing plus a negative, they just write minus and then plus a positive. So that's just positive four. But you never wanna write plus negative three X. You just use your multiplication rules to figure out whether it's actually a plus or a minus. So when you have double signs like that, a positive times a negative is actually a negative. So in that case, I would just write minus. Whereas if you have this, a positive and a positive is positive, so it'd be plus four. Okay. Now, this last one, um, part C, it does have something in common, except this time because it's already all bubbled up, it's very evident what it has in common. Notice it's positive in front. So once I do figure out that, look, here's the plus sign. So this is all one term, and this is all one term, okay? And in each of these boxes, they both have an x minus two in parentheses. So the x minus two in parentheses is the common factor. And there's no negative in front because there's no negative in front up here, okay? But if I were to take these two x minus twos out, remember the reverse of distribution, what are you left with? You're left with the two x and then this positive three. Okay, so the two x and then a positive positive, so it becomes positive three. Okay. So we're halfway through this section. Now we're gonna talk about factoring special polynomial forms, okay? So 
Some polynomials have special forms that arise from special product forms. Um, you should learn to recognize these forms. So we do have the difference of squares and they don't have the sum of squares in here, but I think it's also equally important, okay? Um, this one is prime. But notice that the difference of squares does factor. So if we go back to that front page where they broke it up and I mentioned that we wouldn't know yet on whether or not it factors or doesn't factor. I'm letting you know now that when you have the sum, the plus of two perfect squares, that is going to be prime, which means it cannot be factored. But the difference of two squares can be factored. Okay, so in this case, notice we had the sum of two perfect squares. Four can be written as two squared, okay? This is the sum which cannot be factored anymore. And that's why this one was called completely factored. However, here we have an X squared minus four, and this can be factored according to that formula on the other page to give me these two factors. And now once everybody has a one power, you know for sure that they cannot be factored anymore. Now what we haven't learned yet, and we're not going to until part two of this section, is how to go from here to here, and how to go from here to here, okay? We will cover that eventually, just not quite yet. So here's an example of how to factor something that's a difference of two squares. If you notice that these are two perfect squares, or if you have to kind of figure it out first, do that first. So we know that 9x squared can be found by taking 3x times itself, 3x, which means you can write that expression as 3x squared. And we know 4 can be rewritten as or is equivalent to 2 times 2, which can be written as the expression 2 squared. Now, because there's a minus here in the middle, there is a minus there in the middle as well. But once you know what is being squared, it's just a matter of taking this 3x and putting it in the front of each of the two parentheses, and then taking um, this, this 2 and putting it in the back of each parentheses. And how else are you going to get a negative but to multiply a positive times a negative? Okay. And if you were to check that and foil it all out, you will notice that after you combine your like terms, you do end up with 9x squared minus 4. Okay. Now, the perfect square trinomials, those are great um, if you remember them. I particularly do not ever memorize these. Um, I just don't do it this way. I do it a different way, and I will show you that in part two of this section. Okay but you don't ever have to recognize whether it's a special situation when you have three terms. When you have two terms, yes, you definitely want to see if they're perfect squares. If so, if there's a minus, you can factor it. If there's a plus, you cannot factor it. But for three terms, there's a whole nother road we go down, okay? The last special kinds is if you have two terms again, but you have cubes. And so if you have a plus between those two perfect cubes or a minus between those two perfect cubes, we'll tell you which formula to use. So in this case, they had x cubed plus eight, which can be written as x cubed and two cubed. And so then if you follow the formula, it's basically the front number and the back number in one parentheses. And whatever this sign is, it stays the same, okay? Then what you do is you take that front number and you multiply it times itself and you get this front guy. Then you take these numbers and you multiply them together, you get 2x. And then you take the last guy and you multiply it times itself and you get the last number, okay? Um, and then the sign, whatever sign you have here, you will always have the opposite right there. And then this one will always be a plus at the end. Always, always, always. Okay, notice that in both formulas, it's a plus. 
Here, if it's a plus, it stays there a plus, and then it changes. Back is always a plus. Here, it's a minus, so the first one's a minus, then it changes, and the back one's always a plus. Now here, they recognized that it was 3x times 3x times 3x, which gave us 27x cubed. And then of course, one times one times one is one. So the 3x goes in the front, the one goes in the back. Since there's a minus here, there's a minus there. And then 3x times 3x is where the 9x squared came from. 3x times one is where this 3x came from. And then one times one is where this one came from. Now, if the first parentheses has a minus, the ne next one's gonna be the opposite. And then the last one's always gonna be plus, okay? So they're also pointing out something that will come in handy later in this section, in this unit, like the very last section of this unit um is this word here conjugates okay so if you have a difference of two perfect squares notice that you put whatever was in the square in the front and whatever's being squared in the back and then one has a plus and one has a minus so that when you multiply you get a negative in the middle right well these two expressions when you have the same term in the front and the same term in the back but opposite signs in the middle, those are called conjugate pairs, okay? So this term is a conjugate of that term and vice versa, okay? So here we go, example two. And it says parentheses x plus two squared minus y squared. So the first thing they recognize is this is already in its form, right? You already know what is being squared here and what is being squared here. It is a minus sign. So it will factor into this in the fronts and then the y in the backs, one with a positive and one with a negative. But because there's no coefficient in the front and no exponent up top, there's really no need for these parentheses. So you can just write x plus two plus y times x plus two minus y. Now, if you were to distribute the x and distribute the two, then distribute the y and combine like terms, you would end up with something comparable to this, okay? Now, let's look at this one. So for this expression, what they've done is they've written 16 is four times four and x to the fourth is x squared times x squared. So they've written it as four x squared, the whole thing times itself, so squared, minus, and then nine times nine is 81. Excuse me, so we've got nine squared there. So we put the four x squared in the front and in the front, we put the nine in the back and in the back, and then one of them should have a plus sign and one of them should have a minus sign. Now, but what we noticed is that this is a perfect square and this is a perfect square. But when there's a plus sign, it's, fat, it's prime, which means this will not factor any further. So it stays exactly the same. But we know that when you do have two perfect squares and there's a minus in the middle, it can be factored using the difference of squares again. So they recognize that you could get 4x squared by taking 2x times 2x, and you can get 9 by taking 3 times 3. So the 2x's are in the fronts, the 3's are in the backs, and then one has a plus and one has a minus. Now this doesn't have any more powers and this doesn't have any more powers, so we know that these two are factored completely. And we know because this is a square and a plus that that one's also factored completely. So now part B is completely done. So that is the end of this um, part one for P.4. Um, just so that the video is not as lengthy, I am gonna stop here. And then I will continue in the next video with P.4 part two.